Okay, um, so we'll continue now with what we um, started before. And perfect. Okay, um, so now we sort of mentioned this idea of sort of the imperative and declarative ways of programming. Um, they look fairly similar. So if we looked at the instructions, they were both a list of instructions. Uh, they both had different tasks. They both ultimately led to the sort of soup being finished at the end. Um, but the second seemed actually needlessly complicated for one person. So if you look at the second one, we sort of had these like constructs like shop veggies that were introduced that sort of make it a little bit confusing. And if you look at the first one, we just had sort of a list of things to do. And so if you were a person, you would take that list and that would be your preferable way to do it. That's also why it's the preferable way to code. And so most people who write code do imperative style because it is much clearer and doesn't have the sort of excess things like shop veggies and shop meat, which it's sort of unclear what they do. Um, but if you're trying to utilize several people, you know, how can several people make sort of the imperative soup faster? Um, you know, what you can do is what sort of the, the MATLAB approach is or the um, sort of optimized approach is, is it takes things like you can chop vegetables together faster. And so in MATLAB, if you perform a Gaussian filter or if you perform a um, fast Fourier transform, or in Python, it will automatically take advantage of the fact that you have multiple cores. And so for each individual task, it will use multiple cores to try to get that faster if that's been implemented in that way. But for generally trying to make it faster, it's sort of more difficult. And so if you want to make sort of a declarative soup faster, what you can do is you can give everyone a different task. And it's much less efficient because obviously there's some people who are waiting you know, here for the vegetables to be bought before they do anything. But on modern machines, this has a fairly low overhead. So having tasks sort of running in the background, just waiting for another task to be finished doesn't really cost you anything. And very frequently, you'll have, you know, hundreds of tasks running, even though you only have a few cores, because a lot of them are just waiting for other things to happen. I mean, even at sort of the very simple level, if you look at Windows and you go to processes, you see I don't have a thousand cores in my machine and yet I have dozens of processes that are running at the same time and most of them are just sleeping and not doing anything or waiting for something to come up. And the sort of advantage of this is that when you have this level of parallelism, you can have these tasks that are sort of sleeping and you make your task sort of distributed and being able to run as many different people at the same time without much additional work. And so with having this description, it makes it much easier. And with the description above, it's very difficult because you can't easily figure out where the dependencies with this are. And there might be some dependencies that you didn't know about. You know, maybe if you go to bring buy meat from the butcher, he's gonna ask for your receipt from the market because you get a discount at the butcher if you bought something in the market before. And if that dependency exists, it's not really clear. And it would require someone really to know everything about the market and the butcher to decide if those were in fact two independent tasks or not. And if you declare it this way, then you sort of implicitly put, explicitly put what those dependencies are. That, you know, shop veggies is completely independent from shop meat and the order doesn't matter. And so sort of the results that you have is that you have sort of this imperative approach where you can optimize specific tasks, you know, use multiple cores, use threading and everything to do that individual piece much faster. And declarative where you have the ability to kind of run everything at once. And execution order doesn't matter because all of the dependencies are specified within each subtask. Um, and this then also fits in with this idea of lazy evaluation, which some of you may or may not um, have heard of before. And basically what that is, is that you don't run anything until you know exactly the final result you're trying to get. And so this um, fits in very well with what you do in um, tools like Spark or TensorFlow, even PyTorch, where you have um, 
sort of tasks you build up, but you don't start running everything until you've defined the whole task. You're just sort of piecing together the components. Um, and where you would have an advantage is if there's tasks that never need to be run. You know, for example, if you tell someone to buy tomatoes, um, was that in here? Well, anyways, for this one, if you tell someone to buy tomatoes, but you never end up using tomatoes in the soup and you do lazy evaluation, then it would actually never buy the tomatoes because there's no need to do that task because it's not needed for the final result. Um, where this becomes particularly useful is when you're dealing with really large data sets. Often you just want a preview of a single slice. And so you don't want to analyze every slice or every piece of the giant data set in order to just get that slice, you wanted to analyze as little data as possible in order to produce that slice accurately. And so lazy can be very useful for that um, because it doesn't require you to do all of the intermediate steps if they're not necessary. Um, and sort of the last sort of major challenge of kind of scaling up is this idea of organization. Right? When you have sort of many different files you need to keep organized, um, how data is loaded, copying between data sets and between different tools means sort of a lot of work is involved and a lot of attention uh, needs to be paid into how things are structured and how things are organized so that you can reproduce the results that you got. Um, so one of the things we also won't talk about very quickly, but it's just important that you're familiar with this idea um, of sort of queue computing. Um, and this is where you have queue processing systems. So like Sun Grid Engine, Oracle Grid Engine, Apple X Grid, Condor. Has anyone used these tools before? Just one person? So at ETH, you have access to quite a few of these different tools. Um, so the clusters that they build up, like Beowulf. I think there's a new one that has a new name. Um, anyways, there's lots of different resources available. And they all more or less use these same queue computing systems. And so basically what you want to use these systems for is managing a large number of computers, memory storage, um, and these are all called resources, uh, jobs or tasks to be run, and then sort of users and sort of based on a set of rules of how, who's allowed to run which tasks, how should the resources be shared so that you know, it's not one person running all, using all the processing power all the time. And so the resources are fairly simple, a collection of processors, CPU, GPU, a memory, local storage, um, can also be access to bandwidth or special resources like a printer. So you might not, you know, if you have a 3D printer in a lab, you don't want three people trying to use it at the same time. And so you could have this as part of your queue system so that you have access to it for a fixed amount of time and then someone else gets access to it. And so they're often used in not just large processing um, situations, but situations where you have a limited number of resources and you want to make sure they're distributed fairly. Um, but basically, these are the, the basis for what you're working with, where you know if you have a GPU cluster and someone's not doing GPU processing, you don't want them using the GPUs because it's not a very good use of resources. Um, jobs are sort of specific tasks to run. And these often include sort of the minimum and maximal resources to run with. And so if you look at tools like Sun Grid Engine, I think we have an example here, or it should be easy enough to find an example. So the man pages are quite long and tedious, which should be easy to find. Hmm. No one has an example file. Anyways, um, so I was just trying to find an example file to kind of show what it actually looks like maybe this yeah so here's an example file 
where you basically say, um, this is here a bash script. Um, so this is the, the Linux equivalent of sort of a command prompt. Um, sort of a name of your job, which directory you want your job to run in, what environment you want it to use. And so here we tell it we want it to use sort of parallel processing and we want it to have access to six cores on the same machine. Um, you can also specify this that you want to have access to 30 cores on different machines and sort of MPI and other environments like that that allow that. And then here you specify that sort of you want to have six gigabytes of memory to do this task that you're trying to do. And then you have down here sort of the definition of the input file, the output file, the tasks you're trying to run, and everything else. Um, very commonly, you also have up here the time you expect the job to take so that you get your block of resources for a certain amount of time. And if your task goes over, it gets killed. There's also mechanisms so that you can have it get a warning signal so that it can save everything properly before it gets killed. But typically, you're required to have a time there because you know, if you're going to use a computer for 24 hours, they don't want to give you a task, you know, first thing in the morning because then no one else can use the cluster all day. But if you're going to have a task for 20 minutes, it's very easy to schedule that task because you have your resource free again in 20 minutes. And so it's the kinds of um, things that typically get included because you want to work with lots of different people. And if, you know, 10 people submit you know, 24 hour jobs that take all of the resources of the cluster, then the cluster is completely useless for everyone else for the rest of the day. And so it's about kind of balancing those tasks well. Um, and then you have this idea of kind of users submitting jobs. So which account is submitting the job and how should the resources be shared? And so um, another thing that happens at ETH is the, the research groups that have helped pay for the cluster have much higher priority for using the cluster. And there's some clusters that you can only use if your research group has paid for part of it. And so sort of these fair share or distributed techniques are what determine who gets access to how many resources and schedules the tasks or the jobs accordingly based on how many resources you have available. And if someone who has more resources or more right to use the resources um, will come before you or after you based on that. Um, so the structure of these kind of machines, or these kind of clusters, is that you typically have a, a master node. Actually, you almost always have a master node. And this is the node which every node communicates with. Um, so you'll have one machine where you'll log in to submit jobs. And this machine won't do any processing itself, typically. It's just responsible for distributing tasks among the worker nodes. And so this machine knows where all of the workers are and which ones are kind of doing which tasks. Um, the worker nodes are where the computation is actually performed. And so these are the nodes with sort of the processing power, the GPUs, the large amounts of memory, the fast internet connections or whatever else it might be. And then the last is sort of this idea of the scheduler. And that typically runs on the master node, but often it runs on a different node entirely. And this is a process which decides sort of which jobs will be run using which resources. And so typically you'll have the scheduler running on the master node because that's already communicating with all the nodes. And the scheduler just sort of dictates which jobs go to which nodes. Um, and sort of what's important here is that you as a user actually never interact with the worker nodes themselves. So there's no reason you should be logging into them or configuring anything because the way you're supposed to access these systems is entirely from this master or name node. And that this will then send different jobs to worker nodes, but you don't actually deal with any of those workers directly because all of their tasks are handled by the scheduler and the master node. Um, so we'll have examples of this where we'll run it on one computer, but basically that one computer will be the master, the scheduler, and the worker. And um, there'll be sort of instructions how you can scale this out to multiple computers, but obviously it's much easier to test and check that everything works well when you have all of this on the same machine. But in the exercises, we cover how you do it with Condor, which you can use with your QBI account or your um, ETED account. And then the other clusters at PT ETH have their own set of instructions that you can follow. Um, so one of the things that we'll talk about very briefly 
here is this idea of databases because um, SQL, has anyone who's heard of SQL before or SQL? Almost everyone, okay. It's good. I think normally it isn't like that. Um, but it's one of the good examples of how um, declarative computing works. And so uh, what we'll show here is, you know, if you have a very simple case of sort of animals where you sort of measured their ID and their weight, and then you have cells. And so for each animal, you've measured a number of cells. How can you analyze this in a reasonable way? And so here you have two tables. These might be tables in the same database. And you want to see, you know, is there a connection between animal weight and cells having cancer? And so what SQL allows you to do is it's sort of a structured query language. And it's universal for both searching, um, called querying, and adding data into databases. And it's um, used everywhere. And so if you look at, you know, Firefox or Chrome, the way data is stored inside there, even for individual web pages, is with something called a SQLite database. Because it's a very easy file format, it's much faster than doing something with like a comma separated file or just a text file. And it allows you to store sort of structured data in a very easy way. And so if you're storing like your browsing history, you know, each row can be a website you visited, you have the time. If you want to sort by time, you can do that very easily. And that functionality is already there. And if you go somewhere like Facebook, um, they store their user information in a MySQL database and a Hadoop cluster. But fundamentally, when they're finding all of their users or they're grouping users by which likes they have in common, that's a SQL command that they run that looks very similar to the SQL commands that's running in your browser for one website. And the idea is that you can make, by having this very general declarative language, you abstract away all the details of the analysis. And so the fact that when Facebook groups users by likes, this is then a command that gets executed by thousands of computers distributed everywhere in the world and that when you sort your browsing history by date, this is executed on one core of one machine, is kind of completely independent from the query that you actually do. And so SQL's goal is to make all of the analysis you do look the same if it's one machine and one tiny data set or a thousand machines with a bunch of different data inside them that you don't have to worry about what that actually looks like. And so the basic queries that you perform in SQL are things like sort of select volume from cells. And so if you do that, it basically just extracts that volume column. It's a very basic statement. The capital words here are the SQL commands themselves. Um, then you can have sort of select average volume from cells where type equals cancer. And so here you can see what's the average volume of a cancer cell. And so you could have done this very easily without SQL, if you used Excel or MATLAB or R or Python or any of these tools. But the advantage here is that if this happened to be a database with 100 billion cells in it, this would have been a very difficult computation to do quickly in MATLAB or Excel. But it's exactly the same command you run in SQL. And so SQL doesn't care at all about what backend you're using or how much data is in it. And because you don't say, get the first row of the table, take the value, add it to the second row, add it to the third row, and then divide by the total number of rows. You just say select average from cell where type equals cancer. You give it this declarative statement where the database now has the freedom to do this calculation in whatever way it sees fit. So it understands the relationships between these different columns and rows, and it is able to perform to do a very optimized query and execute this very efficiently. And so the idea is the more, the closer you can stay to this kind of description, the more opportunity you give a computer to optimize that command itself. Um, and so here you kind of see that we have these two tables. We have animals and cells, and we see that this ID in animal is linked to this ID in cell. 
And so what that means is that we can sort of perform queries across these tables. And so you can go select volume from cells where animal in, select ID from animal where rate is greater than 80. And so you can get all of the overweight mice and get the value for them. You can also sort of get the weight and volume for all of the cells where sort of these two met. And so you can start to do more and more complicated queries. And the nice part about this is that you are entirely dealing with this abstract language. You don't have any interaction directly with the data tables or where the tables are. So you can also do sort of network analyses where if you look at things like Facebook, they're not interested in you alone, they're interested in you and your friends or how you're connected with your friends. Um, if you're doing cellular imaging, you're probably interested in which cells are connected to which other cells. And so you can do those kind of analyses as well, where you might have a table with sort of ID1, ID2, you know, the number of junctions between those two cells or something along those lines and that you can start to look at sort of how many connections each cell has by doing select ID, count as connection count from cells, interjoin network on ID 1 equals ID 2, so that you can now see for each cell how many connections does that cell have. And the point here isn't exactly what the SQL line is, is that it's, you can do fairly complicated operations within the SQL environment. And so if you go um, sort of beyond SQL, you'll see that doing sort of complicated network analysis can get very difficult. That if you're trying to see how many cells are within two connections of each cell, that you end up with sort of this inner join and then an inner join. And if you wanted to do three or four or ten connections, you'd have a really, really long statement. And that's why there's sort of beyond SQL. So things that have the ability to express even more complicated relationships where you can look at sort of document-based stores, which is what MongoDB is, or graph databases, which allow you to store graphs very efficiently. Um, so for most problems, SQL or SQL-based databases are the best approach, but for certain types of issues, there's very specific tools which are better. Um, so now to kind of move to the big data part, um, we mentioned this a little bit before, I think in two lectures ago, where we talked about sort of what is big data, and it's not necessarily, you know, that you have a terabyte or 10 terabytes or anything more than a petabyte of data is automatically big data. It's much more about how you work with it. Um, so the typical way of talking about big data is are these three Vs. So you have velocity, volume, and variety. And so it's a, a lot of data that isn't always structured in sort of the same simple format is coming in quickly. And sort of all three of those are important because if you just have a lot of data that's coming in quickly, but it's all exactly the same, SQL databases are a very good way of doing that. And they're much more performant than using like a Hadoop cluster because they're optimized for handling a structured fixed type of data very, very, very well. And you know, if you have just fast processing, of a variety of data, but it's not necessarily very much that's coming in. Then there's approaches like using FPGAs where you build custom circuits that handle this very efficiently, but they don't scale to terabytes of data. They just run very quickly. And so it's kind of important that all three of those are filled so that you're really in the big data realm and those tools make the most sense. And so the, the second part of this is really where scaling isn't scary. And so 100, 10, 100, 1,000 is really the exact same amount of effort. Um, you know, you don't have to reconfigure or rerun all your scripts or manually copy and paste something. Um, this is sort of where, you know, if you're starving for enough data. And so when you look at sort of the groups at Facebook, Google, and Amp Lab, their problem is always having enough data. They have the processing power. They have the analysis tools, but they never have enough data because that's really their biggest bottleneck. They don't have a problem, you know, organizing it or storing it or copying it. And if you compare that to like the Swiss light source, they always have way too much data that they can't keep up with. And so 
It's sort of a small data versus a big data approach where if you're using the right approaches, your data is almost always your bottleneck for doing interesting analyses. And then the last thing is just more sort of um, aesthetic and it's then zero clicks per sample. And so there should be no manual clicking or interacting with your data if you want to scale it to a very high point because obviously your clicking doesn't scale. And so when we look at a brief oversimplified story, this is sort of what Google ran into. And so Google probably are not the inventors of big data, but they were the first company to really have to deal with large amounts of data in sort of a completely different way. And the way they, um, or the first problem they solved with their data was in this idea for evaluating the quality of websites. And so basically what they did is they had this, you know, page rank algorithm so you could go, you know, for every site on the internet, the current site rank is equal to secret page rank function on this current website. And so if you want to run this in parallel, this is quite easy. You know, even in MATLAB, you have this pair for function that you can run. In Python, it's also very simple so that you can now just divide the websites into a bunch of different groups and have each computer run on a group and you can run it very quickly. This isn't very difficult. You know, the first iterations of page rank functions um, worked more like this, where it was very simple to scale up to thousands and thousands of websites because you could just divide your list of websites into groups and run this page rank function on each one of the groups. The problem was the actual page rank function, or sort of the next version to make it even better, was much more complicated. And so, what basically, what you had is instead of just looking at each website and deciding if it was good or bad, you had to look at each website and then you had to see which websites were linked to that site and what rank did they have in order to decide if your site should have a good rank or not. And so this now becomes significantly more difficult to parallelize because now in you can't just break up the list of websites and have each computer run a small list. You now have to have each, all the websites available to all the computers. And this is very difficult. And so, you know, you could try doing something where you sort of break it up into English sites and Chinese sites and kind of say these sites are different enough. We can run them independently. Um, but you have sort of the problem of when a Chinese site links to an English site, that doesn't get counted at all because it doesn't see that connection. The other problem is that, you know, if you could buy a really big, fast computer, and this is also what Google tried to do, they're still working with things like quantum computers, which might magically solve all of their problems. But fundamentally, if you tried to run PageRank on the most powerful computer in the world, one loop of this would take months to run. And so this is sort of well beyond the scope of running quickly and you also have the problem here that you don't just have to run it once that this is sort of an iterative algorithm because every time you run it you update the ranks and as soon as you've updated the ranks you know if the site that was linking to you now gets a better rank you actually have to rerun your site because that will change the rank of your site and of course if you're linking to a site and it's linking back to you you have sort of this loop where you'll constantly be changing based on how those update. And so you basically end up with this massive problem of you want to run this task very quickly. It takes months to run on multiple machines. And as you see, Google's index updates I think, multiple times per day. Having it update once a month would make it completely useless for news websites. Um, and so how can you get this to work well at really a large scale? And then you have the problem that sort of a Google, a hard drive crashes every minute or probably much more frequently now. Um, how do you have sort of a backup computer replace it? How do you know what was on that hard drive? How do you sort of quickly replicate that information? And, you know, how do you make sure all of your tasks that were running on that computer get moved easily to other machines? And then, of course, you know, if you have something like an earthquake or a power outage at one of your data centers, how can you seamlessly make sure that the traffic gets diverted to somewhere else? Um, 
Yeah, and then of course the initial things we mentioned where the page rank doesn't just count, it's actually much more complicated, and how do you deal with that well? <clears throat> and so basically what Google came up with, um, and some people claim to have had this idea before, but Google's the first one to do it with thousands of computers and hundreds of petabytes of data, is this idea of MapReduce. You heard of MapReduce before? Has anyone never heard of MapReduce? A few people, okay. It's about half of them. Um, so it's a very um, sort of abstract idea, but that basically what they realized is that there's many common tasks that are being performed. And so when you look at this page rank function and you look at how they tried to parallelize it in the first versions and making it run efficiently on multiple machines, that there were patterns that were sort of coming out, they were doing over and over again. And what they decided was, is if you, or what they realized was that if you divide all the tasks you're doing into two different types of tasks, one of them called map and one of them called reduce, then you can focus on breaking up your tasks into these pieces and making a tool that does map and does re and reduce very, very efficiently. And that any algorithm that you could express as a map and reduce or multiple maps and multiple reduces, you could run using this tool and it would handle everything you need to do for parallel computing. And so sort of like the idea of SQL, where you can write a SQL query and the database figures out how to run that very efficiently. With map reduce, if you can divide your task into map and reduce tasks, then Google's MapReduce tool allows you to run that very quickly. And in the um, first section, we have the paper where they describe that in more detail. But that um, basically these two functions, the map one is where you have a function that's applied exactly the same way to every element in a list. And the function only depends on exactly that element. And so here, you know, a very simple map function would be x squared. And so if you have a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and your function is x squared, the map of f to l would be sort of 1, 4, 16, 25. And so this is a very basic map function. Obviously, this map function isn't useful for most tasks, but at least it's a starting point. And then you have this reduce function. And so the reduce says basically how you combine all the different elements <coughs> together in order to summarize your results. And so it's a bit more complicated and basically the reduce function you get here is, you know, what we use here for example is just adding together. And so if you wanted to get the sum of all the elements on the list, your reduce function would just be sort of A plus B. And similarly you could get the, um, the average by having sort of two reduce functions or having a reduce function in two parts. And the first one would add it together, and the second would add the counts together. But that what your reduce function then does is it runs on all the data. So you have g of g of g of g of 1 of 2 of 3 of 4 of 5. And then it sort of adds all of those together. And the um, sort of brilliance they had here is that there's a large number of tasks that you can describe as map and reduce, where you break it up into separate parts. And that if you can define that clearly, you can come up with one tool that handles that scaling process for you. And so you can now distribute these tasks on many, many different computers and run them in parallel very efficiently because they're broken up well. And what's also very nice is that if the computer that was working on four crashes, you can just take four, run it on another computer, and you know exactly what operation you need to run it on. So it's very easy to keep track of where you are in this process because you always know what this function is, you know what the input data is, and it keeps that clear. And when you sort of write you know, arbitrary code, you don't know exactly what the input is or exactly what the output should be or what things might be changing or is it using the time or is it using the computer ID or is something else coming in? And when you have this sort of very clear map reduce paradigm, you force people to only write functions that sort of depend on the input. And so it allows you to build tools that automatically figure out when something's crashed and resume that task. And all of those things are sort of kept very clear. <coughs>
Um, so if you look at how it actually runs, basically you have this input data and you have it partitioned into sort of machines all around the cluster. Um, this is also where you have this idea of data locality. And so all of the data in MapReduce or Hadoop, as it's called for sort of open source projects, is on the local hard drives of the machines that you're looking at. And so when you look at Google's web index, it's not one hard drive that has all of the websites on it. Each hard drive has a certain number of chunks on it that it's responsible for processing. And so this means when you apply map to each element, rather than bringing all the data to one machine to apply this operation, you send the map operation to the machines that have the data on them. And this is called data locality so that you can read that data very quickly because it's on your local hard drive. And so this makes this task massively more efficient for dealing with large data sets because you don't have to copy all the data to one machine to run it. You send the analysis to all the individual machines and then they run it locally. And so they don't make any network traffic because all they're doing is reading from their local hard drive. And if you have a thousand machines, they can all read from their local hard drive without any interference with one another. Um, you then have this sort of shuffle or repartition or grouping of data once the map has been done. And then you have sort of this reduce that gets applied to each group. And then you kind of collect the results and write them to disk. And so when you use this as sort of a paradigm, you end up with sort of the data as the input, the map function, and the reduced function. And that whole thing represents a job. And that that entire task you then submit to a cluster to have it run. Yeah. So how does this solve the issue of two different computers not knowing that a website on one computer is linking to a website on another? Um, well, so we don't actually go into the page rate implementation in MapReduce. That's a little bit more complicated. Um, but basically what you have is that your page rank algorithm gets broken up into map and reduce steps. And your map step will be go through a website and export all the links this website has to other websites. And so all the websites will get processed this way, all these links will happen. You'll have in this group step, the sort of grouping together of different websites, and then in the reduce step, the adding up and the computing of these ranks. And so that you can run that over meta iterations, and there is still a lot of data that's sent over the network. There's, you're not going to get around that entirely, but by breaking it up into these steps, you can allow all the reading and parsing of the websites to happen on thousands of computers in parallel. And then you can shuffle and group on thousands of computers in parallel and then run this reduce, which sort of adds them up. And so we won't show page rank here because that's a bit more complicated. We'll show um, just sort of this basic counting words example. And so, um, you know, if you have a folder full of text documents, this is one of the common things you C is the examples in sort of big data setups, and you want to count all the words that appear. And so you want to see how many times does each word appear, what's the most frequent word in all of these different files. That your map function will take sort of a long string and return a list of all the words with sort of a comma and a number of times that that word occurred. The grouping is then performed by keys, so we group all the words together. And then the reduce adds up the value for each word. And so we basically have this L, you know, which might be cat, dog, car, dog, car, dog. We run this map operation and it sort of spits out cat, dog, car, dog, car, dog, whatever. We then have the shuffle and group, which has been efficient, um, implemented very efficiently to kind of group by the first term in that. We then have this reduce which then takes it and adds it together. And so we're able to count all the words very easily. And so this is obviously not a great example because you don't need a big data approach for counting six words. But we have an example here where we use all the lines of Shakespeare. And this is also not really an ideal example, but it's a little bit closer to reality. And so we have in the course um, data folder, this Shakespeare.txt, and it's I mean, every line of Shakespeare that's ever been written. And so you can load in all the data, show a few of the lines, and see, okay, there's sentences here, there's lots of characters. How can we count all the words that show up? And so if we wanted to do this imperative in serial execution, we could do this fairly simple loop where we have, you know, word count, we go through each line, 
We make each line lowercase, we get rid of the spaces, we break by space, and then we only keep the letters that are in the lowercase string, so we don't want to keep all the commas and everything else. And then if it's length, it's still longer than one after we've thrown away all the non-normal characters, then we keep that word. And so what we see is that we can run this analysis and see that there were 26,000 different words that he used, and the most frequent ones were the, and, I, to, of, and the least frequent words were midsummer nights, wanes, new bends, solemnities. And so we can do this analysis quite quickly on a serial computer, but it's a good sort of starting point for performing sort of a larger MapReduce kind of problem. And so what we have, did I skip one? I skip two. And so the first thing we do here is we make the map task. And so here we have this lines to word. This is where it's also very important to make sure your testing <coughs> is in place because if your map function isn't correct or gives the wrong results, then your whole analysis doesn't make sense. And so here we sort of say it should take in one line it should do this split and should output these words. And we have this little test here where we say lines to words for hi, I am Bob. And we have, as we've seen in the Shakespeare test, text, this sort of space, period, space, which for whatever reason in Shakespeare comes up quite frequently and we don't want that counted as a word because it's not a word. And we run it and we see that it gives hi, I am Bob. And that's the right result for what we're doing. And so now we can use um, this tool that we'll mention in a bit called Dask, where you can basically make this thing called a bag, which is the way you talk about storing data in Dask. It's similar to MapReduce and Hadoop. But you basically break it up. You say how big each partition should be. And you see that we now have a bag with 13 different partitions. So we break up all the lines into a number of partitions. We now say we want to run this map operation line to words. And we want to then flatten it. So we don't want all the words to be grouped by partition. We want all the words to sort of be split out um, so that we have them all in one giant list. And we see this runs instantly. There's actually no computation done here because this is all lazy. We then sort of cheat a bit for the reduce. So instead of doing the reduce step, we just use this frequencies command, which sort of accounts for how frequently that occurs and saves us from having to write sort of a silly reduce function that takes the counts and adds them together. We can then take sort of the top 10 from this list or the bottom 10, as we do both of those. We can then run it. We can use these progress bars to sort of show the progress of what's being done. We can then see the top 10 are the, and, i, two, and that those counts are exactly the same as we got in the linear fashion, but that this ran much more quickly and then if we look here, we see that we were actually using four different cores on this computer, but this could also be a number of different computers. And the task was able to run quite efficiently in parallel. And so rather than waiting for everything to finish, we could run these operations very quickly by taking advantage of all the resources that were available. And so this lets you kind of see what was actually done and how well that worked. And so Hadoop is one of these tools um, that use, is used very common at big companies for sort of storing all of your data in a data lake. It's kind of how that's referred to. Um, it has this data locality, and so that all the data is divided up on the different nodes. And so if you want more nodes on your machine, you also, or if you want more data, you have to buy more nodes. And these things are two are linked together. You don't have sort of a separate storage entity. And it's how Amazon, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Facebook deal with their exabytes of data. And so they do have giant Hadoop clusters with all of these data sets on them, and you create these MapReduce tasks in order to run analyses. Um, Spark is sort of the, the follow-up of Hadoop, and this is sort of developed by a group at UC Berkeley. It's now supported by sort of a very large company or a very large startup called Databricks where you kind of focus on making these kind of map, reduce, join, group by analyses. But it's made this quite a bit more efficient and more flexible. And so rather than just having map, reduce, 
If you have map reduce in these other commands, you can benefit from in-memory caching to make all of these tasks run quicker, and you can run sort of very quickly. But basically what you do is you specify sort of without any logistics what you're trying to do. And so it's all very declarative of apply this operation to each block, and it's never tell computer three to load data set from computer two and copy it to computer one. And so all of that happens internally in the framework. You just focus on defining the task that needs to be done. And so Dask is one of the tools that's newer, and it's available in Python, and it's all written in Python for doing these kind of analyses. And it's very similar to Spark, but not quite as developed. And so um, we'll use that for all of our examples because it's very easy to show. But there's a number of other tools which operate in similar ways. And if you um, did the exercises in NIME, you'll have seen that these workflows are also very declarative. You don't say exactly run this one, then run this one, then run this one. If you right click on a block and go to execute, it will execute the blocks in parallel that it needs to do in order to get the result it's currently looking at. Um, but this whole idea of DAGs and making distributed computation by breaking up operations into these graphs that you can later execute uh, comes from a number of different places. And so if you looked at the exercise before, we had some PyTorch examples where we use these graphs. Um, Dask has this, Luigi has this for larger tasks, TensorFlow, Airflow, all work more or less on this principle. Um, and then this is kind of why DAGs make sense and why lazy operations are good. And this is an example from sort of the Facebook um, machine learning group, where that if you're trying to do something like average pooling, which is one of the layers you have in a neural network, and you want to optimize this very efficiently, it's actually not that trivial to do. And so defining the operation is fairly easy, where you basically say the output should be the input plus these other terms. But coming up with the most efficient code is actually quite time consuming. And the difference between sort of the fastest and the slowest can be quite massive. And so you see here, you know, the fastest kernel is 42 microseconds. And the initial iterations were, you know, 13 um, milliseconds. And so you can get orders of magnitude faster by once you've defined your operation or your graph by going through and optimizing exactly what the code does in order to run that efficiently. And so you'll see that for a large number of these tasks, you can achieve huge performance benefits by allowing these tools to implement it in an efficient way which is also very strong evidence that you should never be writing these functions yourself, even if you're very good at C++, because probably this sort of iterative approach, which automatically compiles the code, benchmarks it and tests it, is going to be more efficient than anything you come up with yourself. And so it's a, um, very scary if you really like programming C++, but very useful if you want to perform tests quickly, that you can automatically benchmark all of these things. And a lot of it depends really on which part of the CPU it's able to execute on, how much memory that CPU has in L1 and L2 caches in order to run those tasks very quickly. And particularly for things like neural networks that are running in self-driving cars, you know, if you can run a task in 42 microseconds <coughs> instead of 13 milliseconds, you can run that task thousands of times more frequently and use much more complicated models to have real-time results in what you're doing. And so with Dask, we don't get nearly that level of sort of tweaking and optimization. But what we see here is that we can make sort of these Dask arrays like we did in the very first lecture. We have sort of one that's zeros, one that's ones. And we can show sort of the graph for what that looks like. We can also, you know, add them together. So if we go image 1 minus 10 plus image 2 times 50, we can then see this graph. And we actually haven't performed any computation here. So it actually hasn't loaded any data or tried to do any analysis. It's just created this graph in order to show us what's being done. You know, we can make it more complicated. We can have things like matrix multiplication where we combine these different ones together and make more and more complicated graphs.
to do these analyses. And now, of course, it's much more interesting to show this on real problems we're interested in. And so here we take a 3D foam sample. Um, you know, we read in this plateau border image that we were looking at before, and we can show what this image looks like. We can now use um, sort of these ITK widgets to see um, how this actually looks in 3D. And so this is a, a widget that just came out last week that lets you look at large 3D data sets quite easily and browse around and change the color maps. So it makes doing a lot of this analysis in Python much easier. But now we're interested in is actually sort of doing the analysis. And what we do is we take our foam stack and we break it up into chunks. And so we basically say we want to have chunks that are 20 by 400 by 400. And now we can show the graph for this and see that our image is broken up into five separate pieces. And then each one of these chunks can be processed independently. So rather than having one giant image to process, we have a number of chunks we can do tasks with. We can then use tools like Dask ND filters to perform a Gaussian filter. And so we can perform a Gaussian filter on this image of you know, kernel size 3 by 6 by 6. And what we see is that we create this massively complicated graph because it handles the fact that these chunks have overlaps and that you want to include a few slices above and below each chunk to make sure that your Gaussian filter gives exactly the same result when you run it in parallel as when you run it on one machine. And so it automatically handles all of those sort of overlapping and boundary regions and that's why you get such a complicated graph out here. <clears throat> And again, none of that code has actually been run. This is just showing you what that graph looks like because all of this is lazy. We then have sort of binary erosion tasks that we can do where we basically say, you know, we take the spot parts of the image that are greater than 0.9. We run this ball 12 operation, um, or ball 12 sized erosion to kind of shrink the size of the bubbles. And then we can show the graph there and we can see that it's even more complicated now than it was before. And that we can now run label on all of these slices. And that we can you know, now run on this very large image in 58 seconds, what would have taken before, I think, five or 10 minutes. And sort of generate these different outputs where we see all the different labels that we have for the different bubble IDs. This is still a fairly simple example. And then see sort of, you know, how which tasks were run on which worker IDs, and all of these workers were on the same computer now, but you could run them on dozens of different computers and it would all run the same way. And we can do things like, you know, perform this filter and then only grab one slice. And so here, if we were just interested in slice number 50, we could do that and then we could run this optimized graph so that it only shows us the computations that are needed in order to get that slice 50 out of the data set. So it allows us to avoid having to run huge numbers of computations that aren't necessary if the only thing you're looking at is slice 50. And then if we run that um, for just slice 50, you know, it's done in half a second. And if we run that for all of the image and then take slice 50, it's done in 2.1. And so, you know, maybe this 2.1 isn't that long to wait. But if you're dealing with terabyte sized data sets, you know, being four times faster is significantly better for getting your analysis done. Um, so kind of the last thing is that, you know, having local resources, they're often expensive and underutilized. They require a lot of maintenance. And for a lot of the tasks that you're doing, it makes much more sense to use cloud computing. Because if you just need a computer for one analysis, that's very powerful and then you're done. It doesn't make sense to have a whole cluster that just sits there most of the time and doesn't get used. And even for things like power efficiency, you know, having a cluster that's being used a very small portion of the time is very expensive because even being on having a large number of computers running is very expensive. And one of the nice things about cloud resources um, is that sort of everything's automatically set up you can install and configure whatever resources you want. You have unlimited potential capacity and storage and a limited ability to sort of manage what resources are there, how much memory you have, 
um, who has rights to the data, where the data is stored, what packages are installed. And these are all things that are much more difficult if you're using a local customer environment because IT doesn't want you installing a different version of Python than what they normally use. And so it makes life very difficult for doing some kinds of tasks. Um, so I think we'll stop there unless there's any questions on that. Um, the exercises go into a little bit more detail about how you actually do this cluster task and we'll add a new one which shows sort of a full 3D processing analysis for a larger style data set in Kaggle. And so on Binder, you have fairly limited computational resources. I think you only have a gigabyte or two of memory, but on Kaggle you get up to 16 gigabytes so you can get into slightly more interesting problems, but you're still very limited compared to um, you know, what you can get on a dedicated server or a cluster of machines. But it lets you get a feeling for how these analyses look and how you can run them and start to run them efficiently on a number of machines. And we didn't talk about NIME very much this lecture because NIME has a lot of this functionality built in sort of implicitly because of the way you build the workflows. And you can run NIME workflows on a cluster as well by starting sort of each workflow on a different node or you can use NIME sort of cluster-based packages or Spark-based packages for running distributed analysis that way. Um, but that's sort of where we'll stop here unless there's any questions on that. Okay. Um, in terms of the presentations next week, I assume everyone's signed up now or almost everyone and that so we'll have 11 or 12 people presenting I guess yeah okay so 13 um, in terms of order are there any preferences on when people go? <coughs> so I think there was one group that wants to go preferably first or second because they have another class they need to go to. But is there any other or should we just randomly pick it on that day? Or is there anyone, so if there's anyone who doesn't want to present who's still on there, um, feel free to cross out your name. Otherwise we'll plan. I mean, 13 should be reasonable if it's about a five to 10 minute presentation and then five or 10 minutes for questions that should be well within the scope of the class. So if there are any things that need to be changed, just um, yeah, let me know or just update this list and otherwise we'll present this, we'll do the presentations next week. And sort of remember, it's much more about what's the scientific problem that you're trying to solve, what tools and approaches you tried to do, maybe some examples of code or things that you ran or results that you got or ways that you tried that didn't work out. Um, but really the emphasis is much more on how you're trying to use these tools to solve problems and much less on, you know, look how many lines of code I wrote or what complicated weird feature I could extract. Um, which is interesting as well, but the focus is really why is this useful and how can you solve a problem better with it. So, okay.